Hello and welcome to Counterculture. I'm Peter Whittle.、Uh, now, before we talk about this week's show, can I ask you again? Please do remember to subscribe. Thousands of you are.、Uh, it's very important for us if you do. And what it also means is that when you subscribe by pressing the subscribe button,、uh, if you just go next door to the little blue bell and press on that, that means you get notifications also of all of our programs as they're coming up. Now, on this week's show, we're going to be discussing the Long March. That might be very familiar to you because almost exactly a year ago, we published a book, The Long March: How the Left Won the Culture War and What to Do About It. It was by Mark Sidwell. The book was very, very well received, and also it was very timely because June was the first month in which we started to see what seems to have since then been a continuous onslaught culturally. Coming from our institutions and indeed from outside too, so how much of that is in fact a result of a long march, or is it, is it in fact an entirely different thing? But long march or not, and whether or not it was deliberate, what do we do about it? Now to discuss this, I'm very pleased we have the author of the book, Mark Sidwell. I'm very pleased he's with us today, and also you might remember he did、uh, a documentary for us. In the Heresy series、uh, called "A Free Country" about what was happening to Britain at the moment, and Emma Webb、uh, from Civitas, who you also will know, has just done one of our documentaries this time,、uh, which was called uh, uh, "Britain: A Slow Revolution." So these topics are very, very、uh, germane to what we're going to be discussing today.、Um, Mark, do you think that you know when you wrote the book when it came out last year?、Um, And people said this is very timely. What has happened since in the past twelve months? Would you put that as all of a piece with what you were writing about?、Uh, in, in many ways, in many ways, you know, when the pandemic started, which was actually just before the book was coming out, and we delayed the launch slightly, slightly. I, I remember we talked about、uh, a sort of hope that reality might be about to reassert itself, that more important things were happening, and perhaps we could、yes. move on from some of these these questions. In the book, I was rather more pessimistic, and I think that was more realistic. Then, and, and in fact, we saw these things reassert themselves with with greater strength. And another important aspect that I talk about in the book, which I think really has shown itself、uh, in the past year, is the weakening of many important institutions. One of the problems with this idea of the Long March, which isn't really、uh, the sort of more common conspiratorial idea that there's some people sort of pulling the strings to make all of this happen, it's more a sort of evolutionary process over time of leftist type ideas、uh, of various forms taking、uh, control at the senior levels of, of society in important institutions、uh, and in the ways that that people think about those issues at an intellectual level. But when that happens.、Uh, People in those institutions, which exist to do important things like protect the public,、uh, you know, over the police or, or whatever, they become less interested in that actual job that they're supposed to be doing, and more interested in these cultural questions、uh, and social engineering and, and fashionable causes. And so you have this problem that when something like a real crisis happens, people are just much less able to deal with it because they get distracted、uh, by culture war issues. And I think that's part of what we've seen. In the past year, I mean, the Church of England,、uh, the police, these institutions, which you would hope at a time of crisis would be there for us in various ways, in fact, showing themselves、uh, completely compromised in important cases by by the, these issues. Wouldn't you say as well that I mean, one comment that's been made、uh, many times is that the institutions generally have shown themselves to be just simply not up to the job. I mean. Not just the police and the church, but the civil service. You know, the bureaucracy generally it makes up Britain. Is that it? Sort of has not been adequate to the task when it comes to say COVID, for example. Well, obviously there have been some extraordinary achievements as well. We shouldn't underestimate them. I mean, the, the, the achievements with with the vaccines,、uh, which and and some of the other medical advances, which show that Britain still has that extraordinary capacity to innovate, which is important、uh, for the entire world.、Yeah. The the, the organisation of the vaccine rollout, which I think has been.、Uh, You know, a sort of world-class achievement, but of course that compares very badly to some other things. And Dominic Cummings and others have some interesting insights into some of the chaos that was evident in in Number Ten and other places. And, and you know, it's very hard to react to a crisis. Of course, I think this is the important thing. Anyone would struggle. It's very, very difficult to be good at things, and because it's so difficult, it's very important for institutions that have important jobs not to be caught up in. In easier, fashionable causes like inclusion, diversity, or whatever that might get in their way 
of, of the really essential task that's in front of them. Do you think, Emma, that diversity and inclusion, do you think it is a fashionable cause? Uh, I don't mean to be too pedantic about the use of words, or is it something a little bit more insidious than that? Yeah, I think it, the, the terms diversity and inclusion are not, in the same way that you know, anti-racism gets used, they're not as they appear to be when we're talking about what's going on within these institutions, because they're buzzwords of an ideology that I think it would be wrong to say that that, that, the, that world view that is held by lots of the people who are in charge of these institutions, key cultural institutions especially, that that is just a fad. I think it's something that, um, as Mark has detailed in great, uh, great depth, the, you know, it's something that has deep intellectual roots yeah. going back all the way to the 1960s and beyond. And so it's not, it's not just a case of it being a fad or... Um, terms like diversity and inclusion being something that are, are fashionable. Um, I think that some people <laughs> jump on those terms because they want to they want to be nice to other people. And it, if you're going to be generous to them, you want to give them the benefit of the doubt and say, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions in that sense. But I think there are some people within these institutions who are sort of true believers in this particular worldview. Um, and arguably that worldview, you could say, is quite insidious. I think, you know, this, I mean, I'll lay my cards on the table. You know, this whole thing of pe being slightly well-intentioned or, you know, the road to hell is paved. I don't think it's well-intentioned at all. I, I don't think it is. You, you have to look and say, well, what are their motives, these people? Mm -hmm. To me, they basically either hate the country or they hate the idea of a nation state. They hate the culture, whatever it is, anything which is in fact going to in some way deplete that, they will support. I think it's important to distinguish between ideas of reform and revolution. And there are lots of people who quite rightly, you know, approve of the idea of reform, the idea of taking the institutions that we have and the, the, the country that we have, which is always imperfect. There are always flaws in anything. We can always do better. And we should always care about that. And, and trying to reform something gradually while maintaining its basic structure, which seems like an intelligent and a sensible way to to proceed. And then there's revolutionary ideas where what you're actually interested in is tearing the whole rotten structure to the ground because mm -hmm. nothing good can be done with this structure. And the point is that the ideas that are coming to the fore now, people are following them because they think they're about reform. And they're not. They're about revolution. Mm -hmm. They're about the idea that the entire history of the country, that the entire structure of society is so rotten that it cannot be sustained and needs to be pulled up root and branch. And so these, these very revolutionary ideas are, mm. are taking hold because they're seen as, as reformist when they're not. I think that is exactly it. Um, and that there are people who go along with it as fellow travellers because I don't I think, and this is one of the reasons why Mark's book is so great and why it's so important what the New Culture Forum is doing because a lot of people don't understand these ideas. They don't understand where they come from. They don't understand the sort of ins and outs or the, the, the intellectual background of the ideas. And so many people will just simply see terms like diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, and they think, well, I'm not a racist, so I'm for this, mm -hmm. but don't necessarily understand that the, the worldview that, that's behind it, and the particularly revolutionary ideas that are behind it that do want to sort of scrub everything um, into a sort of tabula rasa to build a new, better world. Um, I think people don't really understand exactly what is going on there because some of the language used around it is you know, buzzwords, but they're, you know, fluffy terms. They're nice things that are hard to object to without seeming like you're a bad person. And so it's easy for yes. people yeah. who do object and who do want to make informed criticisms to therefore be unjustifiably attacked. But um, isn't that also part smeared. of the way it operates? The very way mm -hmm. it operates is actually to sort of use the language in such a clever way that in fact it's impossible it's like saying i don't like puppies mm -hmm. you know it's the same thing it was like with multiculturalism in the past you know people would sort of how can you sort of say well of course it's quite nice well it means lots of nice restaurants it means yeah. it's lovely and fluffy and if you mm -hmm. say well actually there are real problems with it you know in fact mm -hmm. we're living with them now mm -hmm. in the way it divides people up then you're seen as being just suspect yeah. You know, I think this is the problem. But, you know, you've both done programs about aspects of this. Maybe it's slightly different in your case, Mark, because it's about freedom for us. And I mean, the reaction to them obviously uh, means that you've really hit a nerve. So when you say uh, people don't necessarily know 
what these things mean. I think that they are increasingly knowing what they mean, mm -hmm. actually. Yours was called Slow Revolution. So that would tend, did you, did you at the end of it think, yes, of course, we are having a slow revolution? Did you conclude that? I think the most interesting thing that came out of the process of doing the interviews, and this was something that you just touched on there, is that it isn't this sort of conspiratorial long march with some people pulling the strings in this concerted effort. It's a slow drip, drip, drip of a particular, particularly ideological and arguably revolutionary worldview into our institutions, drawing on ideas from American universities that have their roots in French postmodernism, that because they have their roots in French postmodernism are destructive, they want to dismantle everything and pick it apart and criticize it. Um, and it's very deeply connected to your, the documentary that you did about self-loathing as well, that all of these things are, are sort of um, connected together. Um, and I think the thing that, that came out of those uh, interviews that were so interesting was that it is more subtle, it is more complex, and in a way that almost makes it more difficult to pinpoint and identify exactly how this has emerged, but it seems to have been something that's just emerged organically, and that they, there are people who are in positions of authority within these institutions that just very firmly hold on to these ideas that mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. in conflict with the worldview of the majority of people in this country, and I think that's why the, it's hit a nerve. This is very much how culture shifts in a way. Uh, there's, there's some sort of academic work on this, and I, and I touch it in my book and some historical analysis. What you see is the very centers of intellectual power, which are often universities. Uh, new ideas start to emerge, and over a number of decades, they take root and they grow into the positions of influence in a society. And it's a sort of top-down effect that then controls very much what is the common sense, if you like, of a society, the things that are acceptable mm -hmm. to be said and thought in public. Uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, Margaret Thatcher and the sort of revolutionaries of the, of the free market conservatism around her were going against uh, a sort of Keynesian um, socialistic idea of how to run a society uh, that had taken root and was the common sense intellectually of society. They brought in some new ideas, but in the years since then, while unfortunately the, the revolution, revolutionaries who achieved that have rather been asleep at the switch, these new ideas have come in over the past 20, 30 years. Um, Thomas Piketty, uh, who's better known for writing a, a book called Capital about how, you know, rather less free market view of what to do about uh, wealth, did another piece of research about the growth of the Brahmin left. It's very, very interesting because it's proper research looking at what's actually happened to opinion in countries across the West. And you can see it over several decades, the powers that be, the intellectual class in America, in France, in Britain, has shifted significantly to the left. And that's part of what you saw going on with Brexit as well, that sort of class and education divide. Mm. Do you think, uh, you know, when you look at the past years since your, the book came out, um, one thing that strikes me is that if you look at all the institutions we, we've been talking about, and one after the other, you know, they have sort of either joined up the Black to Black Lives Matter or whatever it might be, you know, we've got to decolonize, basically, whether it's the Royal College of Music, you know, or Kew Gardens, or all of these sorts of things. It seems to me that it's almost like they were waiting for an event to happen in which, so that they could then suddenly light the touch paper mm -hmm. and stand back. That's how it feels. I think it's slightly the other way around in that an event has huge consequences and can suddenly flip the equilibrium that a society has as to what's possible to express in public and what ideology you need to address, attach yourself to. So you saw this in a very different way, the end of communism uh, in Eastern Europe in the 1989 period, where literally someone could be, um, you know, a, a rebel who was having to stoke coal boilers because he wasn't, uh, because he was, you know, non-communist, uh, suddenly ending up as the foreign minister like that afternoon and they're having to go back and stoke his boiler because he hadn't been <laughs> taken off the job yet. It happens that fast when a society flips like this. Uh, and again, there's some very interesting work I talk about in my book by a guy called Timur Karan who's looked at exactly why this happens. And it's to do with an idea called preference falsification. We may preference falsification. Fal falsification. We, right. may, we may have our private views, like what I think politically. And then there's the public ones that we know we can say to each other in public or express in a public square. And those are controlled by what we think we can get away with, what will worry other people, what we sense is allowed to be said. And that's the big fight at the centre of what's gone on this last year. That's why statues and 
public pictures are important. That's why it's significant that things are being done while people are not in public places, because then you can control them much more easily, which you're seeing play out with football fans now when they go back to the stadiums and they rub up against this Black Lives Matter stuff. Uh, so I think it's the fight for public expression. That's what's going on. And in fact, it's more that once that happened, once there was that, out, that outpouring of, of reaction, the enormous protests in the streets, it changed what everyone realised they thought they needed to be on the side of the new, the new thing. So it was a big mm -hmm. shift in society. And then you see very, very rapid change spreading all across among these people who have very similar worldviews in any case. Yes, it, it, it seems to me it, it, this, this idea of the public space is a very interesting one because, mm -hmm. uh, as you see, this week, last night, before we recorded this, uh, intense booing uh, a football match. You know, a, as soon as the fans are back in, they're not standing for it, literally. Um, same in a way with the proms last year. I mean, the BBC were almost, they were quite clear about it, weren't they? This is a perfect time to have a reset of the problems, mm -hmm. you know, when there's no audience. And of course, they bargained for that the wrong way because it, it sort of happened. But I mean, do you think, do, your, do the people that you interviewed for your programme, Emma, do they believe in a Gramscian march? Let's make this quite clear again to people. The whole point of the long march, um, rather assuming people understand uh, what it actually means, which is a march of institutions mm -hmm. of the left, essentially having given up on the idea of the proletariat, as it were, sort of like, you know, protesting and, and revolting and overthrowing the bourgeoisie. It's now all come, you know, it's hollowing out of the institutions. Mm -hmm. Do the people that you interview, do they accept that that might have happened or not? I think the view seemed to be more, as Mark was describing, that it was this organic thing rather than a sort of concerted effort in the Gramscian sense. Yes. Um, but what did come out of it that I thought was quite interesting was the the sort of the explanation for why it is that this was allowed to happen um, and how it is that this sort of intellectual monoculture it remains unbroken even if there are dissenters within it. And um, this goes back to that policy exchange study looking at academic freedom, that there is a sort of element of um, cowardice, professional and intellectual cowardice, um, to keep your head down and, and, and not question it in order to get on with your career because the costs are high um, for speaking out. You see cancellations and so on in universities every single day, uh, it seems. And so I think that, you know, that was one of the things that, you know, it seemed that this was something that has happened organically but it was allowed to happen organically because people weren't either maybe perhaps not understanding what mm. was happening as it like a, like a frog with the sort of water yes. he gradually heating up and therefore not jumping out. Um, but also allowed to happen because um, gradually people felt less and less that they were able to question it, to speak out. And so then you end up with this intellectual monoculture. So it isn't necessarily just a case of, you know, the institutions were flooded with people from the left, but also that, you know, key people who hold this worldview are in those institutions. And then the, the environment, the atmosphere of those institutions changes to one of a kind of conformity to a particular perspective. I think, um, you know, in, in the book, you know, you say it is a, a and you, as you just confirmed that, it's a kind of, not, a, not some conspiracy, but that it's been a whole con conflagration of events, really, that have brought, brought this about. One of which is the kind of reluctance of the conservatives to get involved. By conservatives, I mean political conservatives on the whole. Not, you know, likes of you and me or people, in, but actual sort of politicians. They, and that is one area which I, where I think there has been no change in the past year in their incredibly weak response to mm -hmm. the various cultural, cultural onslaught. Would you agree with that? I, I, I think that I mean people like Oliver Dowden, whether you think their responses are not as robust as they could be, but um, Oliver Dowden, Gavin William, Williamson coming out and condemning particular instances. And, and I think more than you would have seen in a, in a previous Conservative cabinet, there have been politicians who have said over the past year, no, this is madness. And, you know, we saw this with... Um, Ollie Robinson, the cricketer who was 
um, they were attempting to cancel him for past tweets and um, Oliver Dowden came out and said um, that this is this was going too far. So well, I think... You see, I don't like this language. You see, this is going over top, this is going too far. Mm -hmm. The implication is somehow or other, yes, we sort of agree with what you do, mm -hmm. but you just went a bit too far this time. Yes. Well, I mean, so they're, they're in a double bind. As I say, what happens is culture war stops controls public expression. So even if a conservative government is in power, they find themselves within this frame that they're then fighting against, right? So they, there's a limit to what they can say, that they are very controlled by this. I mean, my book is really about the idea that this culture war has been lost, that these public spaces are owned by the left, so you're constrained in what you can do. But they are at least speaking out, and there is, there is something, because it is about this fight for free expression, and I talk about the, the power that politicians have, without any, even going near sort of legislation, to just sort of have a, a pulpit where they can say it is actually allowed for you to say these things in public and to fight back against the control of expression like you were talking about in universities, Emma, which is again uh, another form of this. I mean, they have done things like um, got some free speech in university laws that they're looking at. I don't know if they're going to be hugely effective or, or, or well thought through, but there are things that they are doing. I think the culture war is useful to them electorally, even if they aren't willing or perhaps feeling able to fight it mm -hmm. too hard, because it does keep Keir Starmer and Labour unelectable, the more that they force them to sort of fail to, to stand up to it as, as an opposition. You know, I mean, it's impossible for, for Labour to come out against these culture war issues and it's very difficult to appear even patriotic. And that makes them more or less unelectable. And that's very good for Boris Johnson, at least in terms of his electoral prospects, even if he might not be, be fighting it too hard on a policy front. But do you think, I mean, I think that almost... Uh... Well, we should be pedantic about this point, but you almost don't need Boris Johnson for Labour to be unelectable. <laughs> no, 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 no. In the sense that people sort of have twigged the Labour yeah. where they are on all of these issues, mm -hmm. I think, quite a long time ago. I mean, like, even with Jeremy Corbyn not standing for the national anthem and things like this. Well, I think it's a sort of, people see it as a bit of a race against time, and it's hard to know how it goes. Basically, it seems like these cultural issues make Labour or other parties like them pretty unelectable. Uh, but on the other hand, they, they hold all the cultural cards. So the Conservatives have very little room for manoeuvre and are fighting against a hostile establishment in that sense. But the problem is, is, the, is the, the youth, the generation gap. The, the young are very into all of these cultural issues, are strikingly more uh, pro these issues than they, they have been in the past and anti-conservative. Mm -hmm. And if that sustains itself, then over time, this balance, which now is quite well well matched, is going to fall apart and the conservatives might be out of power in, in, in a very big way. And that would be very interesting to see how that plays out. Well, so that, the, that gives new urgency to the problem, possibly. Exactly, because it's one of the younger people you, you mentioned mm -hmm. who might be more culturally uh, sympathetic to, to the woke agenda and everything. Uh, they are not doing the things that generally make people change their mi minds after a while. They're not, they're getting married late. They're having families mm -hmm. late. They're certainly, they can't buy houses until quite late. So yeah. essentially the evidence seems to be all the way along that they're not changing mm -hmm. actually their views. That, that has- and I think the, also that they are, I mean, certainly I feel like I was at this, just at the cusp when this was beginning because I feel like I experienced some of this in my own education. But I think a lot of people younger than me have been sort of marinated in this worldview because it's sort of not in a, in a, a, maybe in as obvious a way, but, you know, very much in the education system. And then they go to university where their life is delayed by three years, which can be quite an infantilizing experience for yeah. some. And in that period of time when they're particularly sort of the, the period of time where if you were to go to, to university under good circumstances, you would be exposed to loads of different opinions. Uh, you would become a sort of vibrant free thinker. The opposite happens. It's the classic Alan Bloom. They sort of go to university to close their mind. Mm. Um, and by which point they then go on from that, possibly with some kind of junk studies degree um, into a career that continues to sort of delay their progress into adulthood in the way that you would say like getting married having children and so i think in a way adolescence is slightly delayed and that has got to have some kind of mm. um or uh, well adolescence is elongated let's say mm. um and that's got to have some influence on like you say the sorts of things that make people settle um that perhaps give them 
more of a rounded life experience that might make them question some of these things um, is something that is delayed well into later life. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I mean, in, in this book last year, Mark, you put forward a few ideas of what could, you know, maybe happen, how, title them indeed, how, how we can uh, fight, fight back. Um, do you still think they are, um, do you see it happening for a start? I mean... I, I, I'll tell you about why I'm optimistic in the yeah. long term. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the long march is a long, slow process, right? And the thing is now, the, 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 the ideas that are now coming to fruition and have power are in full bloom, right? That comes at the end of 20, 30 years of work and right. sort of accumulation of ideas, which means that then there is a period of senescence and decay and the new ideas can come in. So the question is, are people willing to put in the effort to renew the ideas that actually work in society and be the equivalent of, of Thatcher and all of the people that were around her that did that in the 1970s. Because, you know, lest we forget, you know, it was like in the 1950s when think tanks were starting. It took until the 70s for them to have their impact. This is a, a slow mm -hmm. game and it needs money and committed people over a very long period of time to take these things seriously and to, to make these cases. In the short term, things like Boris and, and his people doing things, holding the line, perhaps the, the electoral balance against Labour uh, are useful. But in the long, longer term, I think as long as uh, new ideas are there, which are really just refreshing the old ideas that actually work, uh, I'm optimistic because I think this is you know, the full bloom of something which isn't going to work very well as in the 1970s with all that uh, economic problems that we had and the winter of discontent and so forth. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, it may take a while to get there though. As I say, I think the culture war, in a sense, has been lost, but that doesn't mean that the longer battle can't be won. Do you think uh, the battle will be won? No, I'm naturally pessimistic, <laughs> so I'm not sure um, that I share your optimism entirely. But I do think that you, we're seeing at the moment, uh, and I don't think we should underestimate what we're seeing in terms of people pushing back and building new things, because the grassroots things are what will really make a difference. I mean, we talked about you know, what ministers are saying, but I think what really matters is, you know, organisations like Restore Trust being set up to hold the National Trust to account and it worked. And then uh, the chief of the National Trust resigned. Uh, we've seen it with Save Our Statues and, and you know, the campaign um, about Colston actually having some success and raising awareness about the need for and due ro process. Roads exactly. as well. Same yeah. with roads. And I think there are people who are increasingly feeling emboldened to, and this is what it really comes down to, I think, when you, if you want to break through that intellectual monoculture within these institutions, it requires courage. And you can't have courage in a vacuum. You can only have really have courage in a group, otherwise you'll, you'll sort of instantly be sort of put down and silenced. Whereas if you have lots of people coming out at, you know, at the same time, and saying, I don't agree with this, I think this isn't the right way to do it. That courage, I think, you know, that is that is sort of the, the seed of, of dissent. Um, and seeing people building that into new organizations and saying, look, we've had enough, we're gonna push back against this and we're gonna organize to do that. I think for a long time, people sat on their laurels and just let this happen. And now finally people are saying, no, enough is enough. And we're going to assert our view of this and against this. Um, and I think that that is something that is a cause for optimism. Whether it will be successful, I don't know, but it's certainly a cause for um, sort of injecting a bit of lifeblood into the resistance. I think, I mean, I think people, there's no lack of courage in people, no lack of courage about that. I'm always optimistic. Um, but it is their lack of power that worries me, which is not their fault, right? I, I mean, I. I my two pennies worth would be simply that people have got to realize how much power they can have on the Gillette advertisement principle, i.e. that you just simply uh, withdraw your custom or you cancel your membership or you do all of these sorts of things. You stop watching the award show which is just going to be one endless kind of lecture. You stop going to the football match if you're going to have to go through with all of that, with the, you know, the knee and taking the knee and everything. Sooner or later, hitting these people in the purse actually makes a difference, doesn't it? it I mean, you can arrest it that way. It's got to help. I, I think that 
a couple of things that Emma was saying. Uh, save our statues, some of these other organisations, I think they're great, because this is obviously going to be a destructive period when people are trying to tear things down as, as part of this idea of sort of clearing out the old regime. And things can be saved. So save what you can. That is, that is a good principle. You, you can't stop the, the whole sort of cultural miasma of it, but you can make sure that not too much gets destroyed in, in, in this sort of period of cultural revolution when you try and hold the line. And the other thing is, as well as you know, hitting people in the purse, I would say, uh, as Emma was saying, it's reclaiming public expression, public spaces. So it can't just be about retreat. Mm -hmm. It needs to be about reclaiming uh, the squares and the spaces for the, the sanity and the common sense of, of, of most people in the country. Because of course, when the, when the surveys are done, it's like these, these, these ideas are, it's like a tiny minority of intellectuals who hold them. They, mm -hmm. they hold pressure over everyone because they've controlled our sense of public expression, particularly over the last year. Now that we can actually be in these spaces again, it's important to take them back. Yes, I, I, I'm, you know, it, it sounds like one's being the council of despair here. But I mean, <laughs> the thing is, is that when you say public spaces, what does that mean? In real, in real terms, someone goes up and quotes from the Bible. I might not agree with him, but he's doing something entirely just me. He gets hauled away, mm -hmm. right? Other people can go into the street and say the most blood curdling things about Jewish people and get away with it. Now, to me, that seems that how are we going to reclaim those spaces when, when I feel that our actual, the actual, you know, enforcers of our law, the police, are not even actually on our side anymore? Well, that, that is the problem, of course. But the thing is, it can change very fast in the same way as it changed very fast the other way in the last year when we had these big demonstrations, then suddenly everyone's rushing to catch up with the cultural revolution. In Tahrir Square, changed very fast change very fast in Eastern Europe, where suddenly, yes, uh, yes. you know, in Eastern Germany, there's a demo and a bunch of people go out, slightly more mm -hmm. than normal, and the police don't wallop the hell out of them. And suddenly, overnight, everyone knows that they can get away with mm -hmm. it a little more, mm -hmm. and it snowballs yeah. and it snowballs and snowballs, and suddenly the entire thing's gone, right, overnight. Mm -hmm. That can happen, mm -hmm. that can happen. But it's just, it's very unpredictable when it happens. Probably bound to happen when that many people disagree with this oppressive public opinion that sort of pressed upon them as to how they have to behave in public. But it's very difficult to be the first person mm -hmm. to be out there. I think one thing is certainly sure, and that is, uh, you know, even a year ago when we, we were at this bookmark, um, some people were saying, well, what is this? What do you mean cultural war? They were actually saying that. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you talking about? This is just some, you know, now it's right at the forefront, mm -hmm. is it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the thing that we think about, you know, along with COVID, it's the thing we think about all, all day long, um, which mm -hmm. I suppose is a good thing, uh, that people are aware of, aware of it, and also, I suppose, aware of what they have got to try and save. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how, how quickly public awareness builds about stuff mm -hmm. like this. And yeah. I think that one of the real, like you were saying about, it's controlling really the sort of the spectrum of possible public opinion or public expression, that you know, one of the great benefits of producing this kind of public awareness is that you're giving people the language to articulate mm. what the problem is. Mm. And if mm. you refuse to play the language game of the other side mm. or of, of the worldview that you're trying to counter, you know, you you are giving people the language to, to express their grievances. You're giving people lang the language to express their concerns about things because you know, up until a certain point, people's, you know, language has been sort of restricted and, and compressed in, in sorts of terms that we have, you know, we've, the term woke has sort of come in and out of fashion um, because people are trying to work out what is going on and, and why they don't agree or why, they, and I think that is a very good thing. Um, and and the, the speed at which, like you were saying, you know, all the protests and everything that happened last year, all of that happened very quickly, but sure, alongside that, um, people's understanding of what was already simmering beneath the surface came to the fore. Beforehand, the majority of the public wouldn't have had any understanding of what those underlying um, ideas were and where they came from, whereas now there's much more public discussion of them. So more, uh, it's two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is a reason to be optimistic. Mm. We all agree on that. Um, <laughs> the book, Mark's book here, The Long March, how the left won the culture war and what to do about it. Uh, if you'd like to read it, it's very, very good. It was, it's, 
it's been translated into Slovenian mm -hmm. and uh, very well reviewed and did well for us too. If you'd like to uh, get a copy, then please just go to the uh, website and you can order it there. And by way of trailer, uh, again, if you haven't watched them, really must catch them. Two documentaries. First, Emma's, which was just out last week, called A Silent Revolution. And uh, we've discussed much of what is in that documentary today. It's very, very good getting uh, rave reviews. And Marx, which was the first in the series, called A Free Country, a question mark, which I think says it all. So that's uh, heresies. And so if you go to our YouTube channel or our website, you'll be able to see them both. Anyway, we shall see you uh, next time on Counterculture. Thank you. Bye-bye.